Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics is a numerical and graphical way to describe and display your data. Basically we have all of these different data points. So once we actually collect the information that we're interested in, uh, we have these data points and we want to try to make sense of the data points in, in some way. We want to describe the data that we have without actually doing uh, you know, in-depth analysis of that data. So the easiest way that we have to actually describe this data is by uh, showing it in some sort of graph, showing some feature of the data that we have. And we can, we can pull out quite a bit of information this way. Descriptive statistics is used for many, many different things. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, so one of the easiest forms of descriptive statistics are stem and leaf graphs. Uh, this is a very good choice whenever the data sets are small and they can give you, you know, insights into the data that you have. You can do some comparative studies with them uh, using stem and leaf graphs. Uh, the leaf consists of a final significant digit. And here is an example. So in this case, we have scores probably on an exam or something like that. And the stem is the most significant digit here. So the stem here we have 3, 4, 5, and that represents 30, 40, 50, actually. And then we have a leaf, and that is the least significant digit. So in this case, uh, the stem and leaf together, the first sample is actually 33. The next sample is 42, 49, 49, 53, 55, uh, and so on. So what does this stem and leaf graph actually tell us? How does this stem and leaf graph help us? Well, think about if we had all of these numbers in a row, we just wrote all of these numbers down, and we put all of these numbers in a table uh, with no particular ordering, it would be very difficult to try to pull out patterns in the data. And statistics is basically all about patterns, right? We want to identify uh, patterns within our data. So in this case, we have stem and leaf graphs. And we can already see some patterns. So one pattern that I see is that um, a, a large number of people actually did very well on the exam. They got 90 or above. Uh, and normally people are around the, the 70 or 60 range, but it seems like a lot of people got a 90 or above. Uh, we kind of have a lot of people getting essentially uh, A's and then uh, quite a few people getting Bs and then less people getting Cs and I guess a lot of people getting, I don't know, Ds and then uh, a few people getting um, uh, uh, lower than that. So in this case, I can already see some patterns here and I already know that the distribution is not exactly uh, normal. It's not an exactly a normal distribution. We'll talk about normal distributions later. Um, but what I want you to see here is if we just had all of those numbers written out, we wouldn't be able to pull out any uh, additional information. And even without looking at each sample or the value of each variable, I can already see some patterns here. I can see that like, more than average people are doing good on the exam. Um, uh, kind of we have, a, we have a normal distribution about at, at, in the middle, and then we have uh, kind of a lot more people getting around 40 for some reason. So it's not, it's not a normal curve for grades. And I can tell all of that without actually looking at the individual data points. As soon as I see them all together and ordered, I can see a pattern in the data already. All right. So that's a good way to kind of get a summary of the data that you have. And once you have a summary of your data, then you can start to ask questions about why are so many people getting, you know, 90 or above, or why are people getting uh, 42, 49, 49. Like, what's what's happening here? Uh, another example are stem and leaves uh, side by side. So in this case, we we have we've measured essentially ages, and we have the ages at inauguration for uh, American presidents, and we have the ages at death for American presidents, and then the non-labeled column is um, again our our most significant digit. So here. Uh, the four, five, six, seven would be 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. Okay, so what we can see is that uh, 
the majority of presidents were inaugurated in their 50s. Uh, actually, a very, very large number were inaugurated in their 50s. And a very large number of inaugurated presidents um, died in their 60s and 70s, basically. So we can, we can already start to see some patterns here. And one thing that I notice uh, is that uh, the, the ages at death are actually, on average, lower than the national average. So um, I, I believe the national average in the U.S. is around 80 years old. Uh, so why are presidents dying so much earlier at a disproportionate rate? And then you can start to make hypotheses like, you know, uh, being a president carries a lot of stress. And because they're already, you know, in their 50s, a lot of stress reduces their lifespan, things like that. We can start to ask questions about why these patterns exist. So here it's a very easy way using stem and leaf side by side to compare two data sets. Um, and in this case, we're measuring the same thing, so um, we can make comparisons of essentially two groups uh, or, um, uh, let's say, attributes of, of a, uh, the same person, basically. Okay. Next is a line graph, and I'm sure you've seen line graphs before. In line graphs, the x-axis, or horizontal axis, consists of data values, and the y-axis, the vertical axis, consists of frequency points. Okay, so x-axis and y-axis... Um, uh, basically have some uh, value and y-axis has some sort of frequency point, uh, usually some sort of measurement, and we'll talk more about this in a second. Bar graphs uh, consist of bars that are separated from each other. Uh, very, very useful for showing you know, different groups or different measurements. I mean, you can use it to measure almost almost anything, really. Um, so here we have actually ages, and we have age ranges, so 13 to 25, 26 to 44, and 45 to 64. And then we have proportion. Uh, we're not really sure what this proportion means because we don't have the key, but let's say it's the proportion of uh, you know people that we sampled in a survey. And if it's the proportion of people that we sampled in the survey, then 13 to 25 is 45% of the proportion of the overall proportion of people we sampled, where 26 to 44 is a little bit above 35%, and 45 to 64 is a little bit below 20%. So what this immediately tells me, I mean, imagine that this could be, you know, hundreds of samples or hundreds of data points, but I can very clearly see uh, using a bar graph that, you know, the 13 to 25 year olds are a disproportionate number of this sample. Um, they're probably overrepresented depending on what the survey is about. And older people, 45 to 64, are not equally represented in the sample. Um, so this, this can kind of tell us something about, you know, did we sample correctly or uh, what, like, who are we actually surveying? Uh, did we expect to find um, certain, certain information about certain groups, basically? Um, so again, bar graphs are a very, very simple, very quick way to summarize the data that you have uh, to say something about that data. Histograms are very similar to bar graphs, but uh, tell us something a little bit different. They consist of contiguous uh, adjoining boxes and have both a horizontal axis and a vertical axis like before. Horizontal axis is labeled with what uh, the data represents, for example, distance from your home to school. And vertical axis is labeled uh, either with either frequency or relative frequency. So whenever we're talking about histograms, we are always talking about frequency or relative frequency. Now, to give you an idea of what relative frequency is, we have uh, the calculation is essentially uh, f equals frequency, n is the total number of data values. So we have the frequency of the data value that we're measuring. We have the total number of data values, or the sum of the individual frequencies. And uh, we can then calculate relative frequency by taking relative frequency uh, equals uh, frequency divided by total number of data values here. Uh, on the vertical axis, we place frequencies, label this axis as frequency, and on the horizontal axis, we place the lower value of each interval. Uh, 
we draw a bar extending from the lower value of each interval to the lower value of the next interval. So we're connecting lower values essentially to each other and we get something like this. So for the bar graph there were spaces in between and they were specific measurements of some specific thing. Here we are calculating the frequencies between some uh, point basically. So in this case uh, number of books, let's say the number of books that students read or read per semester. Um, the frequency here are uh, the a number of samples that we took. So in this case, um, we can say that about 11 people read between 0.5 and 1.5 books uh, last semester. Uh, about 10 people or 10 samples read 1.5 to 2.5 books last semester. Uh, about 16 samples read 2.5 to 3.5 uh, books last semester, right? Now we're not measuring, we're not, this doesn't show us the, the exact measurement. So in this case, uh, between 2.5 and 3.5, maybe, you know, the majority of people were reading, or even everyone in that group range was reading 2.5 books uh, last semester. But because we have this range, uh, we're also adding that basically within the range of 2.5 to 3.5. So it doesn't really tell us about specific values. It just tells us about groups of values or frequency groups, frequencies of groups. Uh, what this data immediately summarizes is that, um, you know, as we would expect, some people read book, more books than others. Um, in this case, the, the kind of middle line between 2.5 and 3.5, uh, the majority of people were reading that many books. Uh, but we also see a lot of people not really reading very much. So um, again, if we had this data, which could be quite a few data points, really, um, we can immediately, uh, how can I say this? If we, if we just lined all of the data points up, it would be very difficult to pull out any type of pattern. But because we're showing it in terms of a histogram, I can very, very quickly uh, say that, first off, very few people read uh, more than 5.5 uh, books per semester, you know, only two in our sample. And quite a few people um, or quite a few samples read basically more or less one book per semester. So what we might be able to say to that or what we might want to say um, is that um, maybe we want to ask how can we make people read more or we can use this data to try to uh, plan our strategy uh, and measure basically this is our starting point and we want more people to read you know up to three books per semester so then uh, we can measure again next year and see if this distribution or this histogram has actually changed okay uh, so now I want you to try to use this data to make a histogram. Um, basically, we have all of this data in a chart, and this is how we normally have our data. We have the number of hours my classmates spent playing video games on weekends, right? The data as it is right now uh, doesn't tell me too much. It's very difficult to pull any type of pattern out very easily from this from this data, right? So... Um, what I want you to try to do now is create a histogram, I'll pause the video, make a histogram of this data, and see if you can pull out any interesting information. Remember, we have frequencies, and you can define your own uh, ranges, right? So it could be, you know, one hour up to 10 hours or five hours or whatever you want. Just try to make a uh, histogram from this. Okay, so now that I hope you've, you've attempted to make a histogram, uh, here's an example of the histogram in five hour intervals, right? So what does this histogram tell us? Uh, it tells us that, you know, people first off play a lot of video games and the majority of people, uh, uh, the majority of people spend, uh, a lot of time, basically, um, above uh, 15 hours uh, on video games on the weekends from this sample. Uh, we don't necessarily know w where the sample was coming from, but we can see at least that uh, in this sample, uh, people play a lot of video games on the weekends. Um, and very few people that were sampled uh, don't 
play video games, right? So we went from, let me go back, we went from this table where it's actually very difficult to pull out any type of pattern to pulling out a very, very clear pattern based on five hour intervals, um, the number of people that play um, five hour, in, in essentially five hour increments. Um, so it's a very quick way, very easy way to find patterns or gain information about the data that you have. Okay. So next is frequency polygons, uh, very much like line, line graphs, uh, but we make frequency easier to interpret. We first examine the data and decide on the number of intervals or class intervals to use and the x-axis and y-axis. We begin plotting the data points, and after all the points are plotted, we draw line segments to connect them. So this is very much like a normal uh, line graph, except we are specifically focusing on frequency, just like histograms. The difference here is that histograms connect uh, in a bar um, the lower bound of each, um, each uh, segment, right? And here, uh, frequency polygons basically just measure at each segment. So in this case, for 40, 44.5, we had, uh, in, the, in this sample, zero. For 54.5, we have a 10, uh, what is this, scores. So we have a 10-point difference. So 54.5, we have a frequency of five samples. Uh, it could be the scores for five students, something like that. Um, so... It, one way in the histogram, we're actually making a bar chart and we're connecting the lower bounds of each group. Uh, for frequency polygons, we are just measuring at the lower bound of each group uh, and then connecting them with bar charts. So this allows us uh, to see uh, changes, basically yeah, changes in, in frequency distribution over time. Um, it can be used for a couple different things. Personally, I tend to use histograms much more than frequency polygons, but just know that frequency polygons do exist, and they are uh, quite useful for certain types of data. Okay, so now we have two different charts, and imagine that we want to compare these charts. We have the lower bound and the upper bound. Um, we have the frequency, we have the cumulative frequency for both sets, uh, frequency distribution for calculus final test scores and frequency distribution for calculus final grades. And imagine that we want to compare these. Um, here, comparing them with a histogram doesn't really make sense. Uh, we could compare them with a histogram, but uh, there are better ways. So in this case, frequency polygons are a better choice. So in this case, imagine that the uh, light blue is the final test grade, and the final grade is the darker, darker bluish purple, right? Um, so in this case, I might say that, okay, uh, people did actually worse on the final test grade uh, than their overall final grade. And that completely makes sense because you have things like homework that if they did very well on, they'll get a better overall grade. Uh, whereas if they did worse on the exam, then uh, they'll, they'll uh, yeah, they'll just have that single basically exam point. So in this case, I can see that uh, from the final test grade, we had actually lower um, uh, lower number of A's, a higher number of it looks like B's or C's, and a higher number of well, it actually looks like D's or F's, right? And I can compare those two data sets very, very quickly with this. So I can see the difference between the test grade and the final grade uh, quite easily. Whereas if I was just looking at these charts, it would be very difficult to look at the difference or compare the difference. I mean, if I look at the frequency, I have basically 5 versus 10, 10 versus 10, 30 versus 30, 40 versus 45, and uh, 5 versus 15. Now, I know that there's a difference, but whenever we see this visually, whenever we describe it uh, in some sort of chart or graph using descriptive statistics, then I can say something very quickly about the patterns that emerge. And finally, uh, I believe this is finally, time series graphs are very good for showing change over time. We use this a lot for a lot of different things. For example, um, the amount of people with a certain type of cancer over the years, the amount of crime that happens over uh, a certain time period. Um, overall, uh, globally, crime rates are actually falling year by year. Um, 
the yeah so what does this actually tell us well it can tell us about patterns it can tell us about trends in this case we have the annual consumer price index per year right so we want to um, measure if something is increasing if something is decreasing if there were any big bumps in the middle what do those bumps tell us what can we learn from them um so time series graphs by themselves can potentially be useful depending on what you're measuring or what you want to know. Uh, but com combining them with other types of data as well might also be interesting. So for example, uh, here the a uh, annual consumer price index is increasing. Um, maybe we also want to compare that with the number of sales from our coffee shop, right? So if the price index is increasing and how is that affecting our sales you know so then we could measure our our sales our overall sales from 2003 to 2012 and see how they compare to the annual consumer price index and maybe see if there's some relation there um, just comparing the graphs by themselves does not tell us if there's a relation but it's a good place to start to understand if there might be okay so that's it for descriptive statistics uh, basically, it's just trying to get your data organized in a way that tells us something about the data itself. Uh, we're not doing in-depth analysis. We're not trying to infer any information. We just want to know uh, directly what does the data say. And we try to put that in terms that people can understand patterns in the data very quickly. Now, these patterns by themselves may be interesting, um, for for some types of decision making but basically they're very superficial right so uh, what i tend to use descriptive statistics for is first off describe the data that i have you know what what does this data say about the people that i've questioned and then i use the data to ask uh, deeper questions that we have to use inferential statistics to actually answer so i tend to generate some hypotheses with uh, descriptive statistics uh, and then use other methods to go deeper into the data. But uh, descriptive statistics is a very easy, very quick way to do uh, to gain some more information about the the study that you've done. So that's it for today. Thank you very much.